The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS licence nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Welcome to the Growth Series, which we're cheekily calling Ensemble on Tour, recorded live at the Future Proof Festival in Huntington Beach, California. I'm Peter Diamantidis, and alongside Adele Martin, we're bringing you right into the heart of this one-of-a-kind outdoor wealth management festival. Across these episodes, we'll be sharing practice development and business growth insights, along with standout conversations, surprises, and key takeaways from some of the brightest minds in finance, fintech, and beyond. Get ready to hear who we met, what we learned, and what we're bringing back to Australia. Let's dive in. Hello, folks. Peter and Adele here again today. Day four, last day of the Future Proof Conference. It's um, it's been a long few days, hasn't it, Adele? Has. <laughs> and if we're both a little slow on the uptake, that's probably why. It's not like, the Berlin to No, day. it's not. It's not. It's, a, it's the middle of the day. It's not crazy here, folks. But... um. Look, we're excited to give you the sort of update on the last few sessions we went to, give you a bit of a wrap up of the of the event itself. Today's theme was interesting. It was really heavy on behavioural finance, wasn't it? Yeah, it went heavy on the behavioural finance stuff, which we both love. Yeah, it's good. You're like, woohoo! Funnily enough, and you all will have experienced this at a conference where often there's sort of that last half day that's after the big event the night before and hardly ever anybody turns up. That was today, wasn't it? And we're thinking, oh, you know, and it's a bit quiet. There's hardly any people in the in the audience. There's this massive stage. But it, they were fabulous sessions. We really got some value from today. So we were super glad to be the the nerds in the audience for today. <laughs> now, the first session was interesting. It was um, a collection of CMOs, chief marketing officers, and they were talking about their journey of building from small practices into these large firms they're all now in and how you build a marketing function over time, which, look, a lot of it wasn't sort of relevant to us in that sense, but there was this expression about the tracking that wasn't just lead tracking, was it? Do you want to cover the yeah, words they so use? I like, I love this. The, the you know, data really helps you drive your marketing decisions. One of the things that they track is lead source, which you know everyone should track, but then it's also lead influence mm. because they if and when a client gets referred, it's not just a, like the market referred from another client. That's the source. But actually what influenced them and made them, you know, make a decision to call you was an article that they read or a social media post that they read. Right. And so they're actually having their advisors, you know, record all that. So their advisors are recording the lead influences. So they can see how their like social or blog or podcast, you know, work together with, you know, referral traditional client referral sources. Yeah. So it's like it's it's capturing the trigger to act, mm-hmm. isn't it? Like it's yeah, we've, we've somebody referred us, but we said yes because we saw that article, yes. or we read that blog, or we saw your thing on LinkedIn. Right, because then you can go, "Ooh, that's clearly working." Let's do forty-seven of those, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and so, what I was thinking is, you know, rather than having to rely on our advisors to record it, which you know we've got enough to do, this is where some of those AI tools and recording tools can come in. Yeah, so that can pick it up in the conversation and automatically capture some of that information, which I think the more we can sort of automate this, the more we can have that data. So, you know, when they're that size, and these were big businesses, yeah. they were like big, big numbers. Big numbers. Um, and so at that size, of course, they can have you know um, people to record some of this stuff. But I think that's where AI is going to make some of this stuff more of a level playing field yes. for some of the smaller advisors because they'll be able to record this sort of information more easily as well. Yeah, and she had some interesting language, one of the one of the guests there. Oh, and in fact, I think maybe it was a later session it was, we'll get to it in a second, that was about the stage they're at and really understanding that as a lead, which I thought was interesting. They, you know, once again, niche, niche, niche. <laughs> like it was the last thing they said in that session, if you don't get anything else, declare your niche and to the point that each of them said they, in their career, they wish, in, sorry, in their role they're in, they wish they'd done that sooner for that business yeah. because it just, everything lines up the minute you do that, brand everything. Well, so it makes stuff easy. You also have to do actually less marketing. Right. When you're trying to market everyone, it's a lot of intro general. Yeah. And yeah. lost in the noise. So yeah. the more you can sort of niche, I know people, sometimes advisors are fearful of niching, but the earlier that you can niche, the less marketing will actually have to do. It makes right. It a lot easier. The other thing that, um, was interesting. So, you know, in Australia, we're a bit allergic to 
the word sales and we all, you know, get hives. I mean, it would say selling. Uh, but of course, anybody that's in business really is in the, in the process of selling, whether they like it or not. And, and of course, here in the US, that's just a given and accepted. Um, I wouldn't say it's a dirty word at all. Um, and they talked about how they have these processes that have started to separate the advisors from the people that do that initial conversion this business development rep. Yeah. And I know the work you've done, say, with us and with, with other practices is is certainly dividing up those steps so it's really clear what your sales process is. But I bet you were really like leaning. I like, love it. But nothing is more heartbreaking than when you do great marketing and it falls over the sales. Yeah. Uh, especially when on paper you know they should have went ahead. So for me that sales role is really critical and I believe that, you know, especially – I think it should be a separate role. It should be a separate role yeah. business. Because for me, it would also, you know, free up the advisor's time as well. Right. And so, yeah, they did. They spoke a lot about, you know, this sales role being something that, and this wasn't just in this session. This was across multiple sessions. We saw yeah. this scene come up that, you know, having sales, not everyone is natural in that sales role. Uh, and it, it is a different role to being an advisor. And yes. so, you know, you don't want to be spending time on marketing and having it fall over at the sales. Yeah, and you and I chatted about this even, you know, from my perspective. If I'm doing a sales call, then and and me being the type of person I am, sure I'm like I'm not shy. I don't think I'm happily talking on the podcast. I'm clearly not shy, but um, I find it difficult to promote myself. It's I'd say it's probably a weakness for me. It is much easier for somebody else in your team to wax lyrical about you than it is for you for most people, um, and I think probably for most advisors is that a fair. I think most of them would probably struggle to really, um, and I don't mean big noting, I just mean highlight the great things. Yeah. Highlight the things that are going to happen and that you're really excited about. So I thought that was interesting. Uh, clearly, you'd have to be able to have somebody else doing that sales function or that business development function. You need them to, you need to have a process they can. Well, that's what I was going to say. Yeah. yeah. And this is, you know, you can't just chuck in a visor or another. Yeah. Off you go. In deep, man. <laughs> it should be, uh, they spoke about having a roadmap or curriculum for the salesperson to, to follow. Yeah. And so someone else should be able to come in very easily and get up to speed in the sales process. And we also should then have consistent experience across, and it should have consistent results regardless of who's doing the sales process. If you've got a great curriculum or a roadmap for the uh, sales, they should have fairly consistent experiences. So if you've got yeah. one advisor that's, you know, not getting the same results as the others, well, I'd be looking at your, you know, what is your actual process processes, um, you know, that you've got written. So yeah, for me, that again, that sales is is a critical area of the business if you're in that growth phase, especially. And one, I just don't know. And then that was another project. It wasn't these guys. It's coming up um, later, but since we're talking about sales now, yeah. um, the other tip is to make sure that when you talk, when you're doing any sort of sale, selling. You replace your word I out of it. So don't talk about I, I, I. Even if you're solo, don't say that. Speak about we and us. You're going to sell the company. Yes. So you can't scale without it. Yeah. If you're selling yourself, then they're going to expect you in every part of the process. Yeah. So sell the team, yeah. sell the company, don't sell yourself. Almost, I'd say, to almost to the detriment of yourself. Like I'd be going hard on the team, hard on the – and even the individuals. It doesn't hurt to talk about this one, you know, Bertie or the – exactly. Oh, testing at this you're really going to like dealing with them and you know like that's that gives the person confidence in this team of people yeah otherwise you're always going to be required yes 100 percent. and look that is that might be what you're looking for you might be have a sort of a solopreneur approach but for most people in our industry with the costs we have it's it's difficult to do without at least a team even if you don't have another advisor so you've got to be building up to the client, who else is going to be they're going to be interacting with, or at the very least, who else is going to be serving their needs and doing things for them? Yeah, and I think with these sales too, sometimes we think you know it has to be this full time role. It could just be a part time role, a yes. casual role. Especially now, you know, it doesn't have to be. You know, it could be maybe you've got um, someone else in your admin that wants to like, is great with people, and yes, they, there could be someone else that you could just you know start to transition some of this stuff to. So, uh, yeah, for me, a process for sales, having a documented. So that you can you make sure you're not going to be wasting money on your on time on your marketing efforts. And and when you say document, I mean what we're talking here really is step one, two, three, four, twenty seven. You know, like yeah. And what and what I love about that, and you and I both love tracking things, right? But but I bet most of us have a did the league go ahead or not? Yes, is the extent to which we measure when you've got when you know what the steps are, you can then measure and track where it gets to 
And then you can say to the person doing it, where did it fall over? Like what happened at that moment? What was the thing that meant it didn't proceed? Well, and then I'll speak, well, one of those sessions here spoke about making sure you reviewing your sales calls or even your client calls in general. Yeah. Um, he spoke about how in the psychology, when he was learning as a psychologist, they used to, everyone, he would record the sessions and then they would all watch them back. Like, then, like it was group. As a group. A yes. Group with your feedback. Woo! And so, uh, you yeah, know, why did you ask this there? And so, yeah. For me, that's really important. Whether you are comfortable doing it in a group, but maybe you should do it in a team. You should get each other to listen to each other's you know, sessions. You know, it would be, I mean, think about like professional athletes do it. So why? Every week. Yes. Why yeah. do we want to critique the stuff that we're doing to get better? Yes. So we'd have to incorporate that into the sales process. Absolutely. In and look, that leads us, leads us nicely into that next session, which was titled The Psychology of Wealth. It was an interesting panel of a mix of people. Um, sort of really talking about um, what drives people and not and, and how to engage them. And funnily enough, but this was psychology, but then on the end you've got a guy that's got an AI tool. So it was quite – And what it made clear is we've got to stop thinking. And actually that's a key message for me out of this was he used this expression that he believes – the magic of AI is when we use it to amplify human brilliance. Mm. So not just efficiency, not just automation, but getting behind people or your staff and pushing them along, encouraging them, training them, coaching them. So they've got a tool, this particular gentleman has a tool called Lydia AI, um, and basically it is an AI behavioral scientist. So you can you can have a meeting coming up, certain client, they've got some challenges, you talk to Lydia and she'll help you prep for that meeting with some understanding of where they're coming from from a behavioural sense. Yes, yeah, so I think like oh. I, I loved it. Like you could practice with it. So rather than practicing live with a client, which is dangerous, <laughs> um, you can ask it. Hey, Lydia, I've got a difficult meeting coming up. Now, Lydia knows all your clients. It knows all the file notes. Yeah. It knows all the story about the client. And so it can help you, you know, prep for that meeting and know how yes. to handle it. And has all this innate, like has this actual scientific knowledge. You know, it's being built by people who are scientists and psychologists, experts in this, right? So you're not winging it using your gut. This is real, in, you know, insight. So then if you so have advisor coming in, how much easier is that? Right. So most of the time you learn how to hit all these stuff because you've been doing it for 10, 20 plus years. Yeah. When you've got new advisors coming in that don't have that. Yeah. I think this is going to, those sort of tools like Lydia are going to really help to train that next generation. So yes. It's really invaluable for PYs to have practice no, you don't want to practice with a lot of green age, is what I always no, 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 exactly. He had some interesting language too. He said uh, his view is that advisors are part mechanic, meaning technical and functional, and part guide, which is sort of down that coaching angle. And that his view is, and he is a, this is a tech person, right? His view is AI is coming for the mechanics. And I think that's a really interesting thing to sort of, all of us to sort of really settle in our brains because if our point of difference that we pitch or or the way our clients see us is 95% mechanic, that could be a problem down the track. As in strategy investments. It, it, right. The, yeah, technical. Yeah. Something because there will come a point, and we saw a few on this trip, <laughs> Dell, there will come a point where probably an AI can do a whole lot of that stuff, right, at the very least or Fast close. Up, up. Right. So, so whereas that human, while we can have an AI, Lydia, to help coach us, it can't actually do the coaching. It's just saying, hey, be aware of this, think of that, here's some context, and then off we go and be the human interaction. Mm-hmm. So I think that's that was really valuable. What else did you grab from that session? Uh, I think that was, the, that was my favorite bit was the Lydia one. And yeah. The, the thought of, and for me, you know, we think of these AI tools being used in the meeting. This one was used before the meeting. So yes. you know, where else can they, that sort of led me down a path of where else could we be using these and creating these AI tools? And Maybe we could have a sales AI tool that we could, yeah. you know, practice with. And, and yeah. you know, so for me, it just got, you know, where else could we use this sort of technology and what other areas? Absolutely. I mean, as, and I, this is literally going through my brain as we're talking, so I <laughs> can prep this, but one of the challenges I feel as somebody who's, you know, got a few years under the belt uh, in the game is I've witnessed a number of market cycles. Um, so I remember the tech bu- bubble back in my investment banking days. Uh, so. I could see an AI that could have embedded historical market understanding, knowledge, emotion, how people reacted, yeah. and then PYs, people coming into the industry, could interact with that to get a better feel for how what's happening now 
is really a repetition of what's happened before. So I really think there could be something there that could give insights because there's a whole lot of that sort of that experience that gets lost. You know, it doesn't get transferred. Yeah, until the event happened. And now, yeah, so you've got to go through the pain to then get the outcome (laughs) on the experience. So, yeah, I think that would be valuable. One other thing, there's two other things actually from this session that stood out for me. The, there was a lady there, what was her name, Diana, I think, uh, no, Erin, Erin Wood, and she talks about um, understanding, they talked a lot in the whole conference, like money stories, understanding the client's yeah. money stories, and the way she positioned I like, which was have a beginner mindset, meaning take the time to know where the client or the prospect is coming from. So what is what has formed them to this point, because that's going to define where they go from here. So, you know, our money and and money and another word for sorry, money story could be money baggage, mm-hmm. right? So we've all got these things that we don't realize um, hang around and, and sort of hold us back. And so, you know, really understanding that will mean that you're probably less likely to have the situation we've all had where we've done some great work, we've pulled together some great advice and the client doesn't go ahead um, because or doesn't implement it because there's something holding them back. Has like a question. That- right. Or any of that. Yeah. Exactly. And so- so I think this that's what all this behavioral stuff is about. The only other thing from this that I that I caught that's just a little thing that it was actually the AI guy said, and he said this has nothing to do with this session, but please everybody in the audience, there is a difference between open AI and closed AI. Right. So their tool Lydia is closed AI, meaning they have, you know, stored her up with all sorts of knowledge that's really their proprietary knowledge they've put in as behavioral scientists. It's not going out into the great yonder like ChatGPT. Those are two very different things. And so to really understand that any tools we engage with, understand which it is and understand if it is closed um, AI, are they experts that have pulled that together or is it just somebody that, that's gone, ah, I could build one on how to pick the next you know, school or how to pick that. Like, mm. Right. So I thought that was a really, really good tip. So then ah, the next one was interesting. So we had the next two sessions actually were us watching – a podcast be recorded. So really, to be fair, it's still a panel, right? It's still a panel session, but they're recording it for their podcast. Uh, And the first one, uh, the podcast was called Standard Deviations Podcast, but this was once again about the future of human first advice. Um, There was lots of good stuff in this, wasn't there? There was. And so um, for me, again, there was a lot of stuff around, well, even just trying to define what human first advice was. Like, what is it? And so, you know, there wasn't a standard definition that they gave of what it meant. So, you know, it meant different things to different people. But um, for them, it was, you know, she spoke about it um, being uh, understanding the client and really understanding their, you know, their why and their purpose. Uh, and again, that money story stuff coming in and being important. And um, it was run by Dimensional, I think. Is it Dimensional? They had a lot of resources on their website. Life of, Invested, yeah. I think they called it. Yeah. Yeah. They've, they've done lots of work in this space. So, yeah. And I, what I love is that she did it. With her team. So it wasn't it's, just she was doing it, you know, with, you know, getting advisors to do it with clients. They believed in it, you know, so much. She did her money story. Like yes. Michael Lane did her money story. She did yes. it with um, the team and she saw the impact that understanding the money story had. Like it it gave her insights to change her behavior about money. And yes. Investing. And so. And there was a funny expression I loved. Like, like I, I actually wrote it down instantly word for word. And they were talking about how, you know, we bandy about this money story thing, but I think for many of you, and maybe you listening, um, you're like, really, is that a big deal? Um, you know, wouldn't you know your money story, or right? You're aware of your behaviors. And <laughs> I'm sure it was her description, or maybe it was his, but, you know, in the same way a fish doesn't know that it's wet, we all have money stories, whether we understand or acknowledge them or not. So, you know, for us outside a fish, well, they're in water. I mean, that's a very defining characteristic for them. That's not for a fish. They're just a fish, right? So, these money stories are part of inherently who we are, but they can be so embedded we don't know they're there. Um, and that's where this, you know, the fact that money is inherently emotional. We've got to stop talking about it like it's logical. It is not. Um, and so I think as an industry, we need to start acting like it's emotional. <laughs> yeah, right? So um, whether that means also us, and I think to your point, us being happy to be emotional about it, sharing our own emotions about money sharing our own money stories. That's such a deeply connecting thing. Mm, absolutely. Um, yeah, so the, the Dimensions got a whole lot of stuff on their website around how to do that and how to incorporate it. But I think that would be, you know, and, and something that, you know, clients understanding themselves 
is just something that would be you know, invaluable to them. It's yes. all areas of life. Yeah, it's going to be in financial planning. It's going to pop up in other oh, areas 100%. Of and so we can be the one that, you know, help introduce that to them. Open how, that door. Yeah, how connected will they be to us and how that much value will they have, you know, by understanding themselves better. So I think, uh, yeah, for us, that I love that human first, you know, approach. Um, and there's a, a, so much information uh, out there. So, yeah, uh, that was a, great to be able to see that live. The, so, and just to talk us through, actually, just we'll take a second. They did actually describe the transition of the industry. And I think it's a fair representation for Australia, too, of, you know, we weren't human first, really, because we all thought we were. What does that mean? So they described it as, okay, years back, you know, the industry was all about access. You know, hey, you, client, can't do this without us. Yeah, well, we're the only actually, one. stuff was behind closed doors. Correct. And it was very, you know, cloak and dagger. Absolutely. Um, and then we sort of shifted and it was all about performance, meaning your client can't get these returns without us. So it's like we're the, we're the smart guys, right? We're the ones that can get this done. This human first sort of transition is, in fact, it's all about the client and them thriving and flourishing. It's not about us. It's not about us being the holders of the keys. Mm. It's that it's all about the client. It's all about them thriving. They're at the centre. Yeah, it went from clients being disempowered to now being empowered. Yes, and that is, we might all say we do that, but I think we probably should acknowledge that at the very least, the advice process as it stands does not naturally do that. Mm. You're going to need to build things around it to make it so. So uh, in Australia, being so legislated, I do think, unfortunately, the legislation itself, I think, lends to not human first. Mm. So we're going to have to layer that in um, to get this. But I think actually the impact could be extraordinary yeah. if we can nail this. So then the final one, another podcast recording, this was two advisors who started who started up and now own and run a, a really successful um, business. But interestingly, uh, the session was about unlocking growth, but doing it um, with, a, uh, with an eye on freedom for you and the business. So it's sort of not growth for growth's sake, which it's probably something you don't hear a lot of, actually. No, right. so I'm probably a bit taken back. Because you know, two guys come on stage, you were like, "Oh, here we, we go, go. Here we go. hard core, hustle. yeah." And they were the opposite of that. Yes. Um, and so they were all about being truly intentional with your the business uh, and your life, because otherwise you, you know, end up creating this monster. And they spoke about it being like you know you're a frog in boiling water. It's not until you're there, and then you're it, you know. It's too late. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, they had some examples of stories of people that went to, you know, three to $400 million worth of assets, you know, growing in a year yeah. and, you know, growing at $400 million worth of assets. See, everyone here talks a lot about their farm. Not yes. Um, so now we've fallen into that as well. Um, <laughs> like they're growing very quickly each year and they were winning all these awards as an yes. measure of success. He spoke about, you know, industry awards and that. The, the focus is on being productive and then everyone was about being productive and, um, and they, and, but there was just this absolute level of burnout that they yes. had. And so he, yeah, so he spoke about the strategies that you can use to make sure that that doesn't happen. I think that this guy walked off stage after winning this big award and said, I don't want to have another year like that. He was yeah. absolutely miserable. He was missing his kids, um, sport. He was, yeah. um, you know, tied to the, um, desk and and yeah it, it was so interesting because what they nailed down that i have to admit i and i've worked in merchants and acquisitions and corporate finance so i've seen this on the extreme end um but i had never really nailed it down he used this expression that what happens is the industry rewards the behavior of production the the running the the hustle 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 like you know i think we should probably all build up a deep hatred for that word mm. right i just don't think that that's the point and in fact one of them started the session with a warning and he said, be careful, your work could steal your life. Yes. And I thought, you know, it was really interesting to hear that from people who are still successful, but they've chosen the way they want to succeed and they've been very careful now about that. You know, there's balance in their success. Um, well, I liked when he said that, you know, often um, people leave employment because they feel like they're in a prison. But then they start their business, only create one, and then feel like they're stuck in a prison. They just build their new prison. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, and so, yeah, there was a lot of interesting things. There. Actually, and there was a little nugget in there that I've heard before from other sources that's about the growth of your business and how everybody hits between 10 and 13 employees and have cultural problems, right? And and they get 
lots of pushback from the staff and you're trying to make changes and you, and you get questions and they um, connected that to a lack of like a really clear vision because mm-hmm. as you get more people, it's very hard to just have that vision be sort of by osmosis. You know, it just gets too big, which I thought was really interesting. You know, I love the culture stuff that they throw you yeah, yes. saying culture is a lot of ping pong table or Friday afternoon drinks. <laughs> Um, he said that, you know, culture, I love what he said about you should love on your team like they are your best clients. Treat your team like they're your most important client. Yes. Um, and so I thought that was great. And um, they have a chief, a culture officer, so they're not a HR person. They said no one likes HR. Sorry to any <laughs> HR people. Isn't it? They have a chief culture officer. Things like how they celebrate the team, that's really important, so to celebrate the team. And so for me, they said when the when you've got the culture right, then success is a, is inevitable. Yes. So they worked on. So it was their job. They said as the sort of owners and CEOs to work on like the rules and boundaries uh, and you know and the communication. Uh, and then the solid team just took it and ran with it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I love the stuff that he spoke about with culture. My big takeaway was you know treat your team like they're your best client. The other thing they um. They shared, which they shared sort of as an aside, but they find um, people often ask it is when you're starting up um, and you're quite small, then, you know, there's a lot of risk in the hiring process because it's really hard to, you know, find the right people. And lots of people hire somebody they really like or connect with because, you know, it's about the vibe. And they actually said the reverse. I thought this was really interesting that to minimize the risk of a new hire at that stage, you've got to hire somebody who is, has exactly the expertise in exactly what you need right in that moment. Solves the problem. What's the gap? Hire the person that can absolutely do it. Whereas I think we've all either done, I know I have, or experienced where we have a gap and we go, oh, that person's awesome. They can learn how to do that. Yeah. What? <laughs> like you can probably do that when you're bigger and then you are hiring to the culture. But when you're smaller, you need that expertise. Yeah, because you don't have time yourself to train no. the way you're smaller. And you don't know it either. That's yeah. why there's a gap. Yeah. So yes. so I thought that I thought that was really good advice, actually, that we probably haven't heard before. Mm. Um, now, if you're really – I mean, he's uh, the, the two gentlemen are Brad Johnson and Sean Sparks. Sean's written a book. Um, the book is called The Advisor Transformation. You can get it on um, on Amazon. And, I mean, I've already bought it, to be honest, and downloaded it onto my Kindle. Uh this is, I mean, to talk about balance, but successful growth with balance, it's probably really the first time I've ever seen somebody successfully pitch that as a way you can operate. It's sort of either go hard or go home or do lots of yoga and meditation. Like it is, I've never really had somebody who can sort of balance, sit in the middle there, which both of us were responding to. Like we were both sort of leading forward in this session. Um, which was yeah, fantastic. They went from zero to 100 team members in four years. Yeah. You don't do that without being very good at your vision, culture, yes. operations, which they spoke a lot about operations as well. Yes. And your marketing and sales. So, yeah, the book, I think, covers all five of those areas. Absolutely. And, look, I'd encourage you to go and read it. If, if, you, if that sort of got your attention, the way they describe vision in particular um, was quite different to anything I'd seen before. I think a lot of us have been through a process where you come up with groovy taglines that you're very proud of that are all, you know, fancy and and fun um, that really capture the vision. But they say that's not what a vision is. A vision is literally the picture you have in your head of what the business is going to look and feel like at that point in the future. So it's literally a picture almost. Um, And I guess with AI, hey, you could probably create a picture of it to use as an inspiration. Um, But I like that idea. Make it tangible. You know, make it really visceral. So... That was the last session of the day and of the conference. Um, so let's talk about a few things. You know, now that we're, we've done the four days, we've had all this beautiful weather and sun, and maybe we should talk about that first, the outdoor element. Oh, how I wish we could have an outdoor conference in Australia. It's so different. It's you just that bit more engaged, chilled, Social. But there's something. I also think it's healthy not having that recycled air conditioning. Yes. You know, no one was sick. It's a... <laughs> no, we're and you're all. Yeah, it was just. So, I mean, they had tents and they had um, umbrellas for cover and sun tent screen everywhere. And, and and I understand in Australia that that you know that sun's a little more intense. But even if it was covered but outdoors, mm. it just has a different feel. Yeah. Um. And did it feel during the day like a music festival? Well, no. I mean. Adele last night went to the actual music festival 
which was lots. Actually, why don't you yeah. share? You've well, got to share. Can I just say, they definitely know how to hold a financial planning conference here. They had Third Eye Blind, who, you know, as a millennial, um, Third Eye Blind was big when I was uh, at school. So Third Eye Blind, they had a lot of free-pouring alcohol and spirits. Um, everything was included. So we they had food trucks morning, all day. food, night, all yeah. day. Morning, noon, night, all day for the whole four days. You yeah. have food galore. Uh, we had a hot breakfast when we had the tabletop sessions. Yeah. So you were never hungry. There was alcohol everywhere. Got <laughs> bourbon tasting. Like, uh, I promise we did work. But yeah, yes. like, that's yes. ice cream sandwiches. There was so much stuff. So there was plenty of acai food. bowls. No, I'm saying that wrong. A side A side bowl. So you had to correct me. All Peter all had all. never had an acai bowl, which I was like, are you joking? Uh, so the, and the, the point being that once you arrived, it was all there. It was all included. It was so all I about. Believe how I'm like how are these. So I don't know how they like. Obviously, clearly there's some good sponsorship to have a conference like that because the ticket. So let's just talk about the ticket price. Mm. It was only a couple of hundred dollars to go. Yeah. Uh, so even if you add airfares, which our airfares were under two thousand dollars. Yeah. Um, it's still good value. It's very good value. So, and so for us, like you think about the prices of conferences back in Australia yeah. versus this, and this includes free pouring. Hey, do you want a double bourbon? <laughs> do it like. <laughs> Which maybe we don't know. You need back home. I don't, I mean, I, I know a lot of advisors in the industry. I'm not sure they need that help. Yeah. Well, they can go. Uh, all, we have anybody that's true. all your foods include all yeah. your drinks, you've got entertainment. Yeah. Like they really were very good value for us. And I think. I just, there's a mindset shift when you're outside. I, I, and I wish I could enunciate that better for you all listening, but it really did change. I mean, because you, you go from tent to tent, say for a session, and you got that fresh air and that sunlight. Like it yeah. just was, I mean, to be honest, if I could have my day more like that. Yeah, that's right. right. Like yeah. it just really was, you know, quite magical. So who do we think should attend? It's absolutely a business growth conference, isn't it? Like yeah. practice owners. Or somebody planning, <clears throat> excuse me, to be a practice owner or business owner. Um, if you're an employed advisor, any of the sessions that are, you know, about technical or other based um, probably aren't going to apply because it's quite different here. So I'm not sure if you are an employed advisor that you'll get a huge amount of value out of this one. I think there'd be other conferences you could do. Whereas as a as a owner um, or a practice manager, huge value. You thought you'd be able to go from session to session. And that's the content alone. Um, now, we've both now tried out the table talks and the one-on-ones. Um, I would love an Aussie conference to do that. I was so skeptical beforehand. I mean, to the point of eye rolling. I'm like, oh, this is so American. <laughs> Which is not fair, of course. Bitter, you're being judgmental. But those one-on-ones, and you will have potentially listened to one from yesterday with Dean and I, but it was fun. And you met different people and you talked about different things. It's only 15 minutes. So if the person wasn't all that interesting, you, it's 15 minutes and you're done. But to be honest, if you can't make that 15 in minutes interesting, you're not trying is my view. I, I got better and better at asking the right things, finding out where they're from, what they do, all sorts of stuff. So um, I would lean into those. And I think and you'd say the same. Yeah, with I, the like the right? and I like the table talk. I like the table talk. They had a structure to it on the table to open. Questions down. I did sample yeah. questions before for the yeah. group, right? Yeah. And so one of the things that we didn't know, is so there anyone thinking about going next year, enroll in those because you don't miss content. Yes. And it didn't make that clear. So we we're like, oh, we'll do There was an there. overlap, was there? Yeah, no. While well, the other. You, yeah. you, if you went to these sessions, you if you went to these table talks or the, um, the meets, you didn't miss out any other content. Correct. And in fact, um, that would be one of the, so there's, we've got a few tips, but one of the tips would be if you decide to come, watch your emails closer to the event because there are only certain windows to take advantage of these the table talks and the meetings. So, um, you know, Adele, you missed a couple of those emails, yeah. understandably, because, uh, you know, we're all busy, um, and so therefore didn't get to take advantage of the one-on-ones, right? Yeah. yeah. It, was it was confusing it because they – There's multiple emails. There's three steps to the process. As right. you can imagine, it's hurting cats, right? There's 600 of those meetings in every meeting session and there's mm. 20 sessions. Mm. In it. So there's a lot of them to for them to organize and therefore they've made it quite complicated. Yes. Um, so, But, yeah, heads up, if you do register, keep your eyes peeled for that. Clearly, sunscreen, it's, it's relaxed, chilled clothing. I saw one guy today in the Navy pants – pale blue long sleeve shirt sort of brown shoes outfit that we might see at home. It's that smart casual look. 
he was the most dressed person by a country mile. Even the presenters do. do I don't remember a single presenter suited. No, 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 no. Suited. No, I mean they might have been they might have been tucked in. That might have been the experience. Yeah. <laughs> A little bit formal, isn't that what's in? This is truly casual, yeah. isn't it? Like jo- I would wear like comfortable jogger shoes. Yes. Yeah. Short guys. Lots of guys were wearing shorts and T-shirts, yeah. right? So this was. I wouldn't say like thongs. So, no, there no, were some, but that was very, very casual. casual. They were a bit not, so not, casual. Not, not too casual. No, 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 no. And look, it's um to be comfortable, I'm with you. So you'd be wearing your shoes. Um, other side from that, the other hot tip is the accommodation. Yes. Yeah. So. There, it's huge. This conference is huge. There's, there's over 4,000 people attending. So like one hotel is not going to get that done. Certainly not here. It's not one of the big, it's not like Vegas where you can fit 20,000 people in one hotel. So um, the thing is there's hotels that are right near um, the location of Huntington Beach, like literally along the beach. We're in Newport Beach, which is a 20 minute. Mm. Yeah, right away. That's, it's doable. But it's not easy. Makes a bit clunky. And they have a bus, but the bus, you know, it says that kind of regular. Yeah, it says that, 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 that as in future proof organised a bus for those people that were outside at uh, the other hotels. But it was said it was every 20 minutes, but it was probably close to every 40 so minutes. So if yeah. you just missed the bus, it's another 40 minutes you have to, to have to wait. And so the bus was a little bit clunky. So if we had that time again, we would have booked earlier and booked closer to the venue. Yes. And even, and I would as go as far to say that if you miss the boat and you can't book in the ones they've got, that are the hotel rates that they list on the website that are close, do your own digging for close. You might be able to get an Airbnb or something else. Close will make a huge difference to your experience. Yeah. It, will, it will mean you're not getting up the hour extra early or all those sort of things. So before we dive into our sort of key takeaways, our highlights, um, I'm curious, do you think you'd put this on your calendar every year? For me? Yeah. I don't think I'd make it an every year thing. I reckon I would make it every couple of years. And and the reason for that is I think I have got enough to take away to implement. Not that we can certainly talk about the highlights in a second. Yeah. I don't think I would need to go back again next year. So And it could actually be damaging. And I, I learned that from when we've all been going to FinCon in the US. You go back, you know, the next year, you know, we're near through this stuff from last year and then you get a whole lot of new things you add to your list. It's like it actually can get a bit almost demoralizing because mm. then you feel like you've failed because, mm. right, so giving yourself the time for it to settle. I'm not saying you don't go to another conference. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. But this one, I'm with you. I think I wouldn't, absolutely wouldn't do it every year. And But because it is that growth stuff and because, I mean, you and I saw more potential tech things mm. than what you see at many conferences um, that's going to be valuable. Having that check in every few years could be really valuable to yes. see what's hot um, and to know what's coming. So, yeah, I, I agree with you. And I'm biased. I've got family in the area. So, um, so that makes it easy. All right. So top three takeaways. Top three. Only three. Well, my number one, and this is the whole reason why I came here, was my number one reason, is I wanted to have a client portal. Um, for me, that I could use with the advisors I'm coaching. So with the advisors that I'm coaching, I can – Absolutely, we can get them growing quickly with um, you know marketing that we do. Uh, we can get them um, sales and keep them sales where they can sometimes, um, you know, if they've signed like five clients at once, if they don't have a great onboarding experience for the client, it's, it gets really messy. And, and so, overwhelming. And overwhelming. And, they don't, and, and the client doesn't have a great experience and the advisor's repeating themselves 50 times and referring. Oh, and then your marketing falls down because you're so busy with the other that you can't keep up your marketing. Yes. It's a vicious cycle. So I've been looking for a client portal experience um, to make the client experience better initially, but also for that ongoing communication. I think I said to you, like, I feel like it's so unfair that we put our best stuff sometimes in our marketing when we really should be communicating more to our clients. Yes. And so why does our new clients get our best stuff? And yeah. so, um, and I don't think we can charge those fees, you know, even a couple of grand or five grand, 10 grand, and just see clients once a year. Yeah. I just think that that is yeah. not going to cut it. Uh, and so, that's uh, the one I saw the the most that we both um, love from a client, um, you know, portal point of view. So for me, it has to be a standalone app. I don't I don't want to have something that's web enabled. For me, it has to be able to do push notifications. Yeah, but we're not going to be able to go to that. People aren't going to be checking their emails and stuff, and you have to be able to communicate and get in front of them. And so for me, it has to be a standalone app. It also again be branded, um, so it feels like again makes it more tangible what you do and more valuable. Yeah, um, the push notifications so you can actually get their attention. Um, 
So, and it has to be for me a great, like as soon as they open it, it looks like the other apps that they use. And instinctive. Just, yes, mm. instinctive. With some of the other apps that are standalone that I've seen um, back in Australia, where does the client go when they open this portal? It's like there's stuff everywhere. Many choices. Yeah. <laughs> they go to the documents or they go, it, it, it's a bit clunky. This, I would say, has a very, I feel like social media feed. Yes. And so it's like they're on their Facebook. But page. not just general comms. It could be, you know, a message to them, but it's in the feed. Yes. The natural. In the feed. Yep. So, and it's very, like it fits the size of their phone. It's videos embedded. It's not just a link to a video. So they play it all in there. Um, so for me, that was, and also it gives tasks to the client. So it allows tasks. Um, it also allows you to schedule content out to the client. So it actually has a scheduling function. Um, like you know, your social media does. Yes. And the other thing that it does too is it connects to seamlessly to other apps like eMoney. So eMoney is probably like our version of, of MoneySoft. Mm-hmm. Or, uh, and so you, know, you can do some, you know, if you wanted to track things like net worth or you know, LBR and stuff like that, um, you know, some of that metric stuff, you can and do yeah. outside the app. It had links to things like uh, Docu, not DocuSign, but a version of DocuSign Dropbox yeah. and stuff like that. So um, we that was probably my favourite. Um, the down- so, so your head's done explode listening yeah. to that. The app is called. <laughs> so I've got this thinking habits of the night. Yeah. So I I think it's financial, finical. So F Y N. Yeah. So financial, but F Y N. I think is yeah, that's the way it's called. It's spelled. Um. So it's. I mean, it's being used now. Yes, we think it's coming to Australia. Yes, they said it's coming to Australia. They're looking at they're doing a, a partnership. Um. However, we think that it might be a bit exy. Yes. We, when we looked at their website, we assumed it was going to be like a hundred bucks or whatever a month, or whatever. And when we did some initial digging, it was very uh, expensive. So we'll just see. It's not even in Australia yet, so they can't use it. But if one exists, another could exist. Or could we get some of the other providers to become more yeah. like that? Yeah, so it certainly inspired some thought, didn't it? When yeah. I'm like, Ooh, that's interesting. One of mine that was, pr- and there's a lot of standouts, but this one to me was a shift in or or an expansion of my thinking was going beyond AI, just file noting. So there's a lot of talk back home. I mean, Adele, you hosted a session, didn't you, where you're talking about how you can use AI for file noting, how powerful it is, and we all went, woohoo, that's fantastic, great. Like literally, I'm not being facetious at all. Yeah, it's amazing. But what's clear, I mean, with this conference is we were thinking a lot of small. Yes. Right, so AI already exists now that will take you from pre-meeting prep through the meeting file noting, tasking after the meeting and beyond. So it's it's not a moment in time at all. And I think that stood out to me because I clearly need to be sure I'm applying that every time I imagine where AI could be used is not looking at it too narrowly, you know, thinking that, well, if this tool could impact this, is there some before and after it can also impact? Because, I mean, I just, the prep it could do for you, the positioning even if you've bothered to, you know, taken that time, sorry, to draw out the money story, to maybe do some profiling on the client, for the AI to remind you of that just before your meeting and how this particular meeting, don't forget that, you know, this context or take this angle, but all those things, wow. Yeah. I mean. Or to give you a problem, hey, you know, they've just bought this dog. Right. It can take like, so it could be like a phone call that your team's had. That you didn't need you to can, Exactly. And so it can incorporate the data. That handover is so hard. Yes. Right. We, I mean, in our business, we make t- take a lot of time and effort to try and get that right. And always, you know, it's always something you've got to keep on chasing. Yeah. Um, so the power of, of that. And once again, you know, there's two th- outcomes of that. One, the client sees you are all a team and it is all connected. That's super powerful mm-hmm. to the we, not I, that we were talking about before. Um, but secondly, the number of clients per advisor will lift rapid, like yeah. that quantum multiples, right, of where we're at now. Uh, so to me, that was, that's a huge shift. Um, and so I, you know, that it's going to require some contemplation <laughs> and understanding the different options, but I could see it take, giving us a big leap forward. Absolutely. I think it's going to let us be more personalized with stuff. Yes. And be a better advisor because you're not having to like be a note taker or remember stuff. Correct. You get to like actually be present, you know, meeting. Connect with them. Yeah. <laughs> and so have like be able to have time to do some of this humanized money stuff, human money yes. stuff that we spoke about. You'll actually have space and time to be able to do that because 
you know, the client will get emailed straight away a summary. The task will be automatically assigned to the team. Yeah. Uh, the meeting prep will be done for you. So, yeah, yeah, very exciting some of the ways that they've been able to use the AI tools here. What else have you got on your list of your top takes? Well, another one was the human first stuff, um, incorporating yes. that, which I think we've covered. And for me, yeah, I think removing the advisor from the sales process, um, yeah. but how, whether we can free up their time and do that. So that was my top takeaway. But my favorite definitely was um, the client portal stuff. Yeah. The um, the human first stuff, particularly Lydia AI, yes. I'm definitely going to play with that. Um, yep. And so my take uh, feel free to reach out if you want um, some more details on that. My other one takeaway was, or an action, a literal action I'll do when I get back is this concept that uh, A, CRMs are going to be challenged by generative AI and what can be done, like that story I just told you of the before and after, it starts to question the way CRMs are built and how they're set up. Um, And therefore, I'm going to go back um, when I'm back in Australia and I'm going to reach out to every one of our major tech providers we use. And I mean, I don't, I don't mean advice tech, I mean all of it, any of the tech, and understand where their generative AI journey is and how close it is to be able to get some real traction um, for operations using Gen AI. And if the tool is, oh, yeah, we figure that'll come in the next 18 months, I'll probably seriously consider whether we continue using them because every the, the stuff we saw in this trip isn't even that much of a leap, but it will be for the business. And that's just what we saw at this one conference. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> we were at an advice conference. We weren't at a business operations conference or at a, like, there's clearly going to be more, right? There's clearly going to be more. Uh, so I'm going to get a little more demanding, I guess, with the tools we use mm-hmm. um, as one of the actions. So, folks, you can, what is fantastic, we found out quite by accident, is Future Proof actually recorded every session throughout the whole conference. Um, if you go to YouTube and s- search for Future Proof HQ, I think is actually the handle, you'll find all of the sessions for 2023 in there. You'll find the highlights, like the highlight reels from the days. And I imagine in the next week or so, they'll have the sessions from this year. You'll So you'll actually be able to watch all the sessions. So we've given you the highlights and we've given you sort of the insights, but uh, I would encourage you to go and dig that out. If you see a great one, share it on the Ensemble platform. You know, like use that to... Hey, folks, what do you think? Or if you think it's absolutely crazy, something said, share that too. You know, the more we can debate this amongst ourselves. I mean, there is as much value, Adele and I being here and after the session. I mean, you would every time we turn to each other, we'd be talking about what we think about it, right? So the actual insights aren't are only the first step. It's talking amongst ourselves to get that next layer. And, um, you know, Adele and I have been are more than happy to put ourselves forward as tribute to yeah. do ensemble on tour for other reasons. Yeah, that's right, on the future. Happy to travel the world <laughs> and give you a window into these events and you can work out whether you'd like to go. So feel free to post on the platform where you think they should send us next. Yeah, right. <laughs> Which they didn't quite do. Uh, we came off our own bat, to be very clear. But um, happy to do another one in the future. But hopefully you got some value um, and we can all, you know, move forward with growth but with balance. Thanks, folks. 